Canvas Training. Learn and grow. So today we will be stepping into storage world of AWS. Right? Storage world of AWS has a few products. I go to the full story that we have created. So these are all the storage products that are there. And the most important storage product of these is my S3. Right? So S3 is simple storage service. Simple storage service in the sense, so the name is still says it's simple because it's very easy to use. It's very easy to set up. It's very easy to start. So you can put your content there very easily and uh, you can start using it right away at, after a few clicks or button, right? And it's really easy to configure as well. You get this nice UI, just have to follow the steps that I will be showing you shortly. And if ever you want to read more about S3, here at the top, you have documentation section, right? So if you click on documentation, right? So documentation enables us to read through all the AWS resources that are there on amazon.com related to S3. Maybe you are just getting started. Maybe you need a developer guide. Maybe you need an API reference. Maybe you need a console user guide. So all the material or all the books that are there out for S3 are available for free on AWS itself. When you go to AWS console, the documentation is here, right under support, right? So you have to click here, it will be taken here. And you don't need to go here, but yeah, if you want to just deep dive into S3, you certainly can, yeah? So let me go back to my PPT, all right. So these would be the topics for today. I'll be quickly going through S3, then I'll create some S3 buckets. I will put content in, I will show you how you can upload your data, how you can download your data, how you can version control your data. Say you change your data over time, you how to keep all the copies that you are changing and uh, cross region replication would be having my data in more than one region. As you know, AWS has 24 regions. So you can in theory, keep your data on all 24 of them, right? So that way, even if one region is down, right? One region is three data centers at minimum. Even if one region is down, you have 23 other regions that have your data and your users will never experience that they are not able to access their data or you will never experience that you are not able to upload any data or download any data, yeah? And then we will look at lifecycle management, how the data lives in S3, how it goes from there, how you can move it to Glacier. So don't worry about it. As we go along the class, you'll be able to learn it. You will be able to understand it. Yeah. So this is storage and so on on the console. So when you go on storage tab, this is what you see. These are the storage products that AWS offers. Yeah. So first product is AWS Simple Storage Service. So Simple Storage Service is an object-based storage. What do you mean by object-based storage? Object-based storage means everything that you store, be it a PDF file, be it a text file, be it your photo, be it your video, anything that you store has an identity of its own. So when you store something on your hard drive, on your laptop, or maybe on your phone, when you are storing something, everything is kind of grouped together, right? So even though you see individual folders and files, at the end of day internally for the phone or for your computer it's all same they just have to go serial wise and look at those storage objects one by one but when you are using simple storage service all the identities all the objects that you have stored all the files that you have stored have their own identity right and s3 is almost 99 percent similar to your icloud drive or maybe google drive Right. So Google Drive or iCloud Drive are exactly similar to S3. So S3 is Amazon's way of doing Google Drive or Apple Drive, whatever it is, iCloud Drive. Yeah. So it's 99.9999999999% durable. That means throughout the year, the chances of your data not being able to, you not being able to access that data is 100 minus 11 nines. Yeah, so that means out of an year, the chances of you not being able to access your data is less than one in 10 million. Yeah, so you also have to think about this. So AWS stores huge amount of data. So lots and lots of like whole of Netflix, 
is streamed from AWS itself. Yeah. So imagine how many movies, how many TV shows, how many documentaries, and everything Netflix has. Spotify is streamed off AWS. Millions of songs. So Spotify not being able to serve a song that they have stored in S3 is less than one in 10 million. So this is the reason why Spotify or Netflix for that matter are so reliable. They're never down. Even if they're down, they're up in a minutes because they are on AWS, which is giving them such great amount of durability. So their data is always available and they're able to serve their customers always, right? Another thing is the data is secured. So whenever your data is in S3, right? It's secured, it's encrypted. Nobody can read it except the owner of that data. Yeah. So if you're not the owner of that account, you won't be able to get to the data unless and until you specify, okay, I want this data to be public. Yeah. So public is like saying, okay, this is my website. Anybody can visit it. Yeah. But if you don't make your bucket public, if you don't make whatever file you've stored in there public, nobody except you would be able to access that file. Yeah. So maybe you want your S3 to be accessible to certain number of users. You can do that. Create the user in IAM, right? Give them S3 access and they'll be able to access that. Yeah. And maybe certain users, you don't want accessing your S3. Don't worry about it. Just go to IAM, remove S3 access from them and they won't be able to access S3. So with the help of IAM, you can control, okay, this person can view my data. This person cannot view my data. This person can read my data. This person can also upload to S3, also change the data in S3. Yeah. So that way I can have very granular control over S3, over the data stored there, and I can be serving my customers with 100% availability. Yeah. So let me go to console. You go to services, you go to S3, or you can type S3 here and you will be table taken to S3. So there are two S3 and S3 Glacier. Today we are studying S3 only. Yeah. So once we come to S3, this is how it looks, right? So the first step in using S3 is to create a bucket, right? So bucket is like a folder. All your files that you are going to be uploading will exist in this bucket, right? So just click on create bucket. Okay. Now you have to fill out this small form like step one. Okay. What is the name of this bucket? So this bucket's name should be unique in whole world, right? So if you, because this bucket will be available over internet, even if you make it public or not, it's still going to be available on the internet. But yes, if it's not public, nobody will be able to see your data or upload your data, but still it has to be available over the internet for it to be highly available, for it to have that 11 nines of consistency, right? So let me put it like my first bucket, my first AWS class bucket, my AWS class first bucket, okay? So now I get to choose where I want this bucket to be, okay? I have chosen US East Northern Virginia. Don't worry about it. Click next. So if that name is not unique, it will give you an error. Okay, I am not able to create this. Okay. Now the second option that you see here is versioning. Keep all versions of an object in the same bucket. That means whenever you change an object, object. So maybe you have uh, five files five small text files there, right? And somebody else comes along and they delete one of those. Okay. And somebody else uh, changes the content of the text file, same file, but with different content, right? Now, when you come tomorrow, you are looking for those files and they are simply not there because somebody has changed them or somebody has deleted them. If you have enabled versioning enabled, AWS will keep the versions of your file. So as you are changing files, it will keep recording those changes and you can revert to a previous version. Even if somebody has deleted, you can just go back and restore that file. Yeah. So this is the, how the versioning works. If you want to learn more about versioning, if you want to read about it, here's a small article, just click on it. 
and it will take you to this page where you will have everything explained about versioning. See, it's a one page article. So maybe when you're traveling to work, maybe you have a couple of minutes, just go there, click on it and you'll be able to see it. Yes. So versioning enables us to keep the records of a file if it ever changes. Yeah. So server access logging. So this is my second option there. So what is server access logging? Log access for request to your bucket. So say somebody comes along and they want, they downloaded something from S3, they uploaded something to S3, they just viewed some files. Do you want to keep those logs or not? So like yesterday you asked me, okay, if I do something with my AWS account, would they be able to know? Like if I have deleted someone, if I have created someone. So you can always enable logging. For sensitive services like IAM, it's always enabled, right? But for some services that are not that sensitive, you can always enable it and you just have to click log access request. So now when you are logging, you have to have another bucket, another target bucket, right? Where you will be storing those logs, okay? So you want to store your, those logs somewhere else, you have to just put the bucket. So let me create. So for now I'm skipping this, but we will enable it because I will be needing another log bucket for that. Now tag is something similar that we did with IAM, wherein we created department and then we created its value. I'm not going to create it for this because it's just for decorative purposes. Now see this object level logging. So this is bucket level logging. If somebody is coming into your bucket or not, this one is for objects. So do you want to log at object level or do you want to log at bucket level? Bucket level is okay. Somebody this did something to this folder, but the object level will be somebody did something to this file in this folder. You're getting for server access. You are only monitoring that bucket, that folder in which all your files are. But for object level, you are monitoring files as well. Okay. You can enable it. You can, you have to create a cloud trail for now. Just keep it. Just keep it simple. Now default encryption. So default encryption is something when you upload a file to AWS. Yeah. When you upload a file to AWS, when it's just staying there, you're not downloading it. When you're downloading it, definitely you're downloading it over a secure port and everything. Nobody else can see it. Nobody can intercept your download. But when it's just staying there on AWS server, right? Do you want it to be encrypted or not? Do you want it to be password protected? If you click on it, there will be two options. One would be AES-256, another would be AWS KMS, right? So if you go with AES-256, it will just encrypt your file and when you are downloading it, it will send that file after decrypting to you. When you are using AWS KMS, that is key managed service, you are providing AWS a key. So you can generate a key in AWS KMS. It's another product. We will work with that product in future, but for now, just keep it simple and do use AES-256. Yes, there is an option to not trust to AWS with their encryption. You can supply your own encryption mechanism with AWS KMS, right? Now, permanently allow objects in the bucket to be locked. This will just allow you to lock your objects. Lock your objects means once you have written the object, once you have created that file, you cannot edit it, right? So see this, write once and read many. It's called worm model. So once you have written an object, once you have uploaded a file, it will just stay there. You cannot change it. If you want to change it, you have to delete it and then upload it again. So this is the locking mechanism that AWS offers. I'm not going to use that. And you can also request CloudWatch metrics. Okay, how much data is going in? How much data is going out? And so on. So for now, I'm just keeping it simple. I'm just encrypting my data. I'm just keeping all versions of my object. Next type, click on that. Now, here you can allow or block the public access to your bucket. So see block public access. So public access is granted. Say you want something to be uploaded to S3, which you later want to be accessible 
to all the users maybe you are netflix and you have uploaded a movie to s3 and you want that to be accessible to all the users that's not how it works for netflix but i'm just giving an example so what they'll do they'll create a high definition file of a movie just upload it to s3 and then each and every user on their application they will see a s3 url in the back end and when they click on that url they'll be able to download that file yeah and they'll be able to see the movie but right now i am not going to become netflix or spotify so i'm going to block all public access so this is blocked by default unless and until you have a very good reason to unblock this right so it will ask you again okay do you really want to unblock it the reason is sometimes just people create public packets and they put sensitive information in there because it's open to world it can really leak right somebody is can download that information so a lot of big companies lot of really big companies have made their mistake and they have paid the price right so if you go to google right aws s3 public hack right so you will see how i hacked amazon s3 bucket misconfiguration so there will be tons of you know resources right so fedex like exposed private in for thousands of people because they left their aws s3 bucket public in which they were storing their customers data so you can really make mistakes sir because you are on internet and you are able to access it somebody else might also be it all comes down to the permissions that you have set the safeguards that you have set around it if your safeguards are not good they'll be able to access your info yeah so the best safeguard that you can provide right now is block all public access then you click on next okay so here it will tell me to review it my bucket's name is my aws class first bucket my region for now is us east northern virginia i have versioning enabled the rest all things are disabled except the encryption and my public access is blocked and system permissions are disabled when i create this bucket right okay so this is my first folder or bucket that i have created inside it right so i am getting my date i am getting where it is it's in one region i am getting how many buckets i have i have my bucket itself and if i click on that bucket now i see the upload button i also see the create folder button so let me upload something here so see this to upload a file larger than 160 gb use aws cli or sdk or s3 api so what is the reason behind that why saying 160 gb if your file is very big you should use a bigger some kind of programmatic method okay so if you are if you want to upload a file larger than 160 gb so what happens is if you are uploading it from your laptop right so your laptop might not be able to support such a big file in an upload manner another thing is your internet connection can stop so if you are using aws cli or sdk they have pause and resume functionality they can break your file in smaller components and upload it like that so you have all those options but when you are uploading via laptop you don't have all those maybe i'll upload this file the same file that i created yesterday so here it is i click on upload i can set individual permissions for this as well so let's set that so i put that file in so first is manage users yeah so who all access have this so i this is my account name i have read as well as read write options okay i can give access to other aws accounts as well but right now i'm not going to do that manage public permissions i have blocked public access for the report itself okay so here is the storage class that aws gives me okay so first is standard frequently accessed data so it will be available in at least three availability zones within a same region so a region has at minimum three azs three availability zones and my this data will be replicated across all three of them right it will be one url i will be giving only one url but yes it will be available across multiple of those okay then i have my intelligent tiering this is for long lived data with changing or unknown access patterns so 
this is how it works. There is some data in an organization that is accessed on daily basis, right? Maybe there is your attendance, maybe there is your files that you work with daily, on daily basis. Maybe there are some accounts, files or something like that. Then comes some files that are used maybe once or twice a month. They can be used for all seven days, but then they are not being used for a month and then they start using it again. It can be some sort of training material. So maybe you have hiring every month, right? So whenever a new hire comes in, you have to access those training materials for them. Yeah. So that way, maybe you don't hire anyone over the period of 30 days. Maybe you can hire a bunch of people over that 30 days. So you can have intelligent tearing for that kind of data, right? So then you have standard infrequent access, long range, but infrequently accessed data. Maybe you have something like log files, a recent log files, maybe a month old log files. You want to go out there and see, okay, what happened, right? What are the logs? How can I view those? Then you have one zone IA. This will be replicated into only one availability zone, right? So you're putting your data into only one data center. So if that data center is out, you won't be able to access your data. And definitely it's cheaper. So this is most expensive, less expensive, less expensive, less expensive very less expensive and this is almost you know very cheap and this is also very cheap so one zone is one data center then you get glacier so archive data with a retrieval time ranging from minutes to hours so all this you can just click and you will get your data instantly on a click of a button yeah but with glacier right if you want some data you have to request that okay i want this data you click the button AWS will go look for that data and come back. Okay, now I have your data because they're storing that data on not hard drives, but on tape. So they have tape drives, massive tape drives inside. It takes time to spin that tape, find your data and, you know, make it available to you over a hard drive. But yeah, it has more than that. Then you have Glacier Deep Archive data, archive data that really, if ever needs to be accessed with the retrieval time in hours. This one has from minutes to hours, maybe from five minutes to maybe two hours. This can range from more than five or six hours. Okay. So this one is really slow in retrieving. Once you have made the request though, after the data is available, you can download it at normal speeds. But yes, for requesting that data, you have to, you know, put your request and everything and it will take a long time. And then you have reduced the redundancy. Okay, so this is not recommended. Why it's not recommended? Because standard storage class is way more effective. This one is way more effective rather than using redund reduce redundancy. So it's almost same, but if ever a customer comes in who is paying AWS for standard access and AWS don't have space for you, they can knock out your data from one of the data centers. Yeah. So with standard, you are guaranteeing it will be three, but here it can fluctuate. It can change. And the pricing is almost similar for standard and reduced redundancy. It's not much of a difference, maybe less than a tenth of a cent for one GB. So it doesn't make any sense to, you know, go for reduced redundancy. So for now I'll keep it standard. Okay. So whatever you want, like whatever data you have, you have small hints here, what kind of tier you want to select based on that, you can select it. Okay. So do you want encryption? Yes, I want encryption. Let's do with Amazon S3 master key. Do you want any header or anything? I'm not going to do that for now. It's just a way to log it. So review one file, one permission, standard access, encryption. Yes, no metadata, no tag and click on upload. As soon as you click on upload, you will see one operation in progress. It started, it's completed. And now you have your file on AWS. Okay. Now if I click on this file, okay, I click on here, I'll be able to download. Yeah. So if I click on download, I'll get that file. It's downloading. Now let me take this link, right? So this is the link to this file and download it from maybe an incognito window. This is a new window. I am not logged in here. Let me do it. See? access denied why because i'm coming in not as my authenticated user but i'm coming in as public so it's giving me access denied if ever i make this bucket public i will be able to download this file let's do that right now okay 
So my first bucket, go to permissions. This is it. Okay, block all public access, done. Save it. I have to type confirm. Now my bucket is public. Let me look at my object. Look at objects permissions. Okay. I have to change its permission as well. Okay. Permissions. Okay. So public access, everyone. So what access I want to give? Just read object. Okay. I'm going to click save. And if I go there again, I should have access. See, now I'm able to see that PDF. Now I'm not getting access denied, right? So what I did, I first went to the bucket, right? So this is my S3. I clicked on the bucket. Okay, I'm inside the bucket. Then I clicked on its permissions. This is bucket permissions. So it was block ugly, all public access was on, right? So I clicked on edit. So it was like this. I unchecked it and then I saved it. It asked me to confirm, okay, do you want to make this bucket public? I said, yes, let's do it. Let's do it. So my bu bucket was public. I again went here. Then I selected this object. As soon as I selected it, this small window popped up and I clicked on permissions. As soon as I clicked on permissions, it asked me, do you want to give public permissions or not? I clicked on everyone. Okay, I want to give pub permission, public permission to everyone. So then it asked me, okay, what kind of permission? Just that read permission. Do you want to read object permission, write object permissions, what you want? I just, just read the object. I don't want to be giving, you know, people access to permissions and everything. I just want them to be able to download this Clicked on save. As soon as I clicked on save, I was able to download. Now, what if I have to remove the public access? Same process. Click on everyone, right? Remove this. Click save. Public access is removed. You will no longer be able to download that. I also have to remove public access from this bucket itself. So I click on bucket permissions. I click on edit. I block all public access and I click on save. So it asked me to confirm. I click on confirm and my public access is removed. Now when I go into an incognito window and type my AWS app PDF, it, I won't be able to access it. Okay, so it's a bit simpler than IAM, right? Because in IAM there are a lot of permissions, there are around 240 permissions, lots and lots of products. Okay, so another thing. So whatever I have done till now, it's covered in free tier. Okay. But if you go for cross region replication, you won't be covered in free tier. So you will be exceeding your free tier limit. Okay. So let's go to S3, click here. So you go to management, right? In management, you have to go on replication. On replication, you have to click on add rule. So what do you want to replicate? entire bucket okay click on next where do you want to it to be replicated so you have to create a bucket in another region as well okay so let's create a new bucket what would be the bucket's name so let's take this name itself so it's already owned by you so it won't let me so let me ask it one and see this that one was us east Northern Virginia, let's say I want to do it in California as well. Yeah, now it's in California. So do you want to change the storage class? I don't want to do that. Time control, how much faster do you want within 15 minutes? Okay, change object ownership to the destination of bucket owner. No, I don't want to do that. Click on next. When you want to copy data from one bucket to another, you want to have S3 access enabled in IEM for that bucket. Okay, so let's create a new role. Name of the role would be S3 cross, cross region 
एक्सेस ओके ठीक नेक्स्ट सो यू क्रिएटेड एस थ्री क्रॉस रीजन एक्सेस सो वाई इज दिस आई एम रोल रिक्वायर्ड इफ यू आस्क सो दिस आई एम रोल इज रिक्वायर्ड बिकॉज नाउ वी आर टॉकिंग अब टू बकेट राइट सो you will be uploading your data into my aws class first bucket and it will be replicated to another bucket that is in another region with a different name right and you can have multiple buckets with different names and they will all point to same data now what happens this aws bucket that bucket 1 is not same as the other bucket maybe they have same data but they won't carry same permissions as each and everything in aws works on the concept of minimum access even aws resources cannot access each other without your permission without you granting them i am permissions so you have to give them permission you have to give them a permission to read data from each other upload data into each other so that they can fetch the data from there into the replication right when you click on save you will create a bucket come on okay See, now my cross region access is enabled, and my replication is enabled. So that my source bucket is my first bucket, and the destination bucket is first bucket one. This one is in Northern Virginia. This one is Northern California. So you will be charged twice the amount because we are keeping your data in two regions. So you will be charged for standard access into two. So what is the pricing for AWS? If you ask, right? So just go on Google, click on pricing AWS S3. Okay, so pricing. You click on first link. This is this is the pricing. So for S three standard for in Ohio or maybe we can look at Northern Virginia. For first TB in a month. Okay, so you are you fifty thousand GB of data. First fifty thousand GB of data will be billed on zero dot zero two three per GB. so if you upload say 10 gigs of data you will be charged 20 cents 23 cents in a month for 10 gb of data if you upload 100 gb of data you will be charged 2 dollar 30 cents right and uh, it, this pricing will continue so on till 50000 gb for next from 50 1000 gb to 450000 gb you will be charged 0.022 okay and then over 5000 tb so people actually use over 5000 tb uh, they use half a million gbs it's no big deal they do man in something like netflix or spotify they use do use that then you will be charged 0.021 per gb okay so this is the uh, pricing for s3 standard this is for s3 intelligent not much of a difference if you see for first tb first 50 tb yeah infrequent access yeah very different like it's almost half the price one zone even cheaper glacier more cheap and glacier deep archive see how cheap it is but yeah you sacrifice your usability when you are doing that okay so this is the pricing so when you are doing cross region replication say you have 100 gb so for 100 gb you are charged 2 dollar 30 cents so with cross region replication into two regions you will be charged 4 dollar 60 cents okay let me pull up a exam question okay so so this is a blog that one of my friends had set up quite a while ago so he was uh, one of the first guys who really went out there and uh, you know collected all the resources about aws and put it up in small web pages i'll share this link with you so these are the questions like what does aws s3 stand for okay this is the actual question from aws solution architect exam you have to know simple storage service okay what are characteristics of aws s3 objects are directly accessible via urls host as a relational database very limited size what else no these are two options right you are building an automated transcription so this is more of a good question that comes in so you will get these questions that the, but these will be like four or five questions 
you have to answer a total of 45 questions out of that you must answer i think 30 or something so so yeah this is another question so this is a good question so you are building an automated transcription service in s3 ec2 worker instance processes an uploaded audio file generates a text file and you must store both of these files in the same durable storage until the text is retrieved right so you do not do the storage capacity requirements are which storage option is cost effective and scalable now what this problem statement say you are doing something on amazon ec2 right don't pay attention to like transcription service and instant processes just focus on aws services what it's trying to say you are using amazon ec2 to do some work on some files okay these are files and you want to store these files and you should be able to retrieve it okay look for the verbs there okay what you want to do and the capacity requirement should be there can be unlimited number of files and what is cost effective and scalable okay so if you are already on ec2 and you want to store something right so for storage you have to go for some kind of storage mechanism now it has to be cost efficient scalable and fast because you want for it to be available okay s3 another thing ebs volume snapshots when you will study about it they, you cannot really download from them okay so that's out multiple instance stores that's out because you are already working on ec2 instance why would you look for another instance when you are so that's out and then you are left with these two okay so glacier i told is very slow it takes hours and hours to get the data so you cannot have a user service that needs frequent access with glacier so the only option is a single amazon s3 bucket okay yeah so this is how it works so what you have to do is like when you are studying s3 once you are you know very comfortable around moving around then what you can do okay you can solve a few of these questions so here lot of lots of so like 15 20 questions are there 13 are here some will be in the comments just read through these sessions and you will get to know okay these are the parts aws is asking questions about and uh, these are the one that i have to pay attention to okay all right so that's how you upload something into s3 you download it from there so what if you want to delete this right so you go to actions you go to delete as soon as you click on delete you click on delete and your bucket is now empty right so now as you had enabled versions remember we enabled versioning a while back even if i have deleted that right so it has kept a log even if i deleted that my file is still here right so if that was an accidental delete i can always retrieve it back right so i can always retrieve it but it will always be here if it was an accidental delete so you don't lose any data because you made a mistake now if you want to remove these versions as well then you have to click on delete okay so you will be removing the versions as well so it's great like it shows you all the versions but yeah you should be careful so if you keep on changing a file it will keep storing all the versions right so after a while you will be taking massive amounts of space for same files so you have to go out there and flush the versions out that you don't need right but yes it's a great safeguard to have if the, your data is important you always have versioning and you can always move back to that data okay so this is the versioning what's the versioning all about now there is a very good use case you know where you can host a static website on s3 okay so what you can do is when you want to host a website traditionally you need a server okay but s3 provides a functionality where you can host a website on s3 without using a server okay so what you have to do is just select s3 select your bucket click on properties and click on static website hosting option so let's do that right now uh, click on properties and this is so use bucket to host a website click on it so what will be the index document i click on i index dot html okay so do you want an error document error dot html so html is actually your web page okay so redirection rule i don't want any redirection rules i click on save 
let's see uh, my permissions block all public access but i want my uh, website to be publicly accessible so i remove i click on confirm okay and it's confirmed so now i have this so static website hosting is on so if i go here right now it will be empty because it's nothing there so let me create a index.html file and upload it here okay so text edit and uh, hello hi so this is a small file that i am going to save so it's index.html okay Okay. Right. So I saved it. Let's see where my file is. It should be in documents. Here is my index.html. I will have to upload that. Add files. Index. Upload. Next. So. Grant public access because I want this to be accessible to everyone because it's a website. I click on upload and we have upload. Now, see, this is my website. So, so I'm not just downloading this file because I file be downloading. I will be getting it like this, right? But as I have hosted it as a website, so I have my own website. So you can have your own website as well if you want. Okay, just create, create a bucket, put a file in there, index.html. Whatever you want to write in your website, you can put there and you will have that. Okay, cool. So this is another use case for Amazon S3, wherein you can host your websites. Okay, so what you have, what all steps you have to take to host a website, so go to S3, click on my first bucket, whatever your bucket is, click on properties, static website hosting. You have to click there, you have to use, click this, you have to provide them the index document, okay? You have to provide them the error document I haven't provided, but you can, and then click on save. Once you're done, so your static website hosting is ready for that. Now you want to upload this index.html. Another thing is the permission should be public because you want this website to be accessible over to all the public. And then you upload an index.html file. In this index.html file, you can write whatever you want and just upload it here and you will have a working website in no minute. Looks good. Really easy. So maybe you can all come up with your own websites on S3 and anybody can, you can share whatever you want. Maybe you can start a blog on S3 itself. Okay. So all your uh, blogs can stay here. Okay. So we looked at version control, right? How the version control works when, when we deleted the file. I think uh, this would be it for today's class. Bye bye guys. Take care. Bye. Good night. Jan Bass Training. Learn and grow.